Okay, everybody, we're back again. It's day five. Where the hell is this week going, man? This is just flying by. I can't believe how quickly it's going. Yesterday, another fantastic interview. What were your thoughts on yesterday, Carrie? Oh, it's so fascinating, wasn't it? So fascinating. Well, I absolutely love play anyway. I absolutely love play. And I love the way she described to get you guys going with play and her different ideas, especially when we talked about puppies, about keeping those puppy teeth away from our fingers. So she gave us, which gave you and me extra ideas to go away with and get going with. So I hope you all played with your dogs last night. I'd love to hear if you had fun with them. How can you not have fun with the dog, man? It's one of my, it's, you know, it's the thing that lights my days up is when I get up and we have play sessions with the dogs because you can see the enjoyment in the animal, but you also have fun yourself, don't you? Yeah, like yeah, that. and it should be. Yeah. Fab stuff, fab stuff. So today, who are we speaking to today, Carrie? So today we've got Alex. Oh, Alex Wilson, of course. Bloody hellfire. You know, I love this guy. And... When speaking to him, he's got such a calming influence about him. And the way that he describes what it is that he does is, is, is mind-blowing. It really blows my mind. And I guess we should get into it, shall we? Welcome, Alex Wilson. How are you doing? I'm good, and it's lovely to be on your show. I'm really, really thrilled to be here and equally thrilled to be sharing the Tellington Method with you because I just love this work and very passionate about it. No, thank you so much for coming on, Alex. It's a pleasure, pleasure talking to you. Do you want to start by um, introducing yourself and telling people a little bit about what you do? Yeah, my name is Alex Wilson. I'm a Tellington Tea Touch practitioner and I've been involved in this work for close on 10 years. Um, I sort of came about from a chance meeting. I was um, working for a company called Ellen Collins and Herbal Products, selling herbs for horses and dogs. And we did an event called the Holistic Horse Show, and the next door stand was Tellington Tea Touch. And I'd come from the thoroughbred racing industry, very conventional part of the horse industry, and I'm setting up my stand and I see the stand Tea Touch, and I'm thinking, touching horses? Okay, each to their own. It sounds a little bit off the, off the wall for me, but, you know, I'm sure it'll be, um, I'll, I'll find out more about it when the show opens. Anyway, the, the show opens the next day, and there's a lovely group of people working on the stand, and they discovered, they discovered an interesting fact about us, which we had a coffee machine, and they didn't. And so, um, as it turned out to be an absolutely horrific show, nobody came to it. They just spent their time stealing coffee from us so obviously I took that opportunity to speak to Sarah Fisher, Marie Miller um, and Ju Julie Sadler and some of the other practitioners about what Tellington Tea Touch was and actually found that it wasn't just about horses but it was about dogs as well. I at the time had a new puppy, a Siberian Husky puppy and to put this in perspective she's now 13 years old so that gives you a sort of time scale and we we got chatting and by the end of the three days of this show, I'd made a sort of life decision that I actually wanted to leave the horse industry, work with dogs professionally and become a Tellington Tea Touch practitioner. It took me another couple of years to take the, to take the leap and train and it was the best decision I've ever made. Um, and I, I suppose I work pretty well full time as a Tellington Tea Touch practitioner. Um, I teach the work a lot on, on, on Zoom. I also work with Linda Tellington Jones and her sister Robin Hood, who head up Tellington Tea Touch um, across, across the water in Canada and the US. And we, um, we work very closely with Linda and Robin, um, putting together the um, dog practitioner training program um, on the live stream element of it um, here in, in the UK. And we have our students as well. Fantastic. So it's really uh, worldwide. It's, it's used all over the world and up and coming by the sound of it, even more up and coming. Yeah, uh, tea touch. It's. I think the word. I don't think up and coming is is the word I describe, but e evolving, um, because even though Linda is in her eighties, and I don't think she'd mind me saying that, she is still evolve. The work is still evolving. She adds new touches. She adds new elements of the work, as does her sister, and even the practitioners will um, add things to to the work. And yes, as you said, Claire, it it is definitely is an international. Um, it is international work, and there are 
are um, T-Touch offices here in the UK, there are T-Touch offices in the US, Canada, South Africa, varying European countries, and also in, in, in Australia. Um, so yes, you there, there are a few countries in the world where you wouldn't be able to find a Tellington T-Touch practitioner. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, so what, what do you think makes Tellington T-Touch unique? T-Touch is unique because unlike a lot of um, unlike a lot of training methods, you don't have to use all of it um, to use it. We like to describe it as a toolbox and you can dip into your toolbox and use it alongside other things that you might do. So for example, if you're a clicker trainer, if you are a BAT instructor, if you're a concept trainer, a games-based trainer, you, there are still elements of T-Touch that you can blend into the work that you're already doing. So we're not coming to you as a trainer and saying, you own, you can own, you, you know, if you're working with a dog, you must just use T-Touch. What we're saying is have a look at what we do and see if you can use some of that to help the dog and work with that dog in front of you. And are there, there elements of T-Touch that can really um, help with, with that dog? That might be the light pressure body work that we do. That might be the leading exercises. And I think one of the really interesting things is we see so many trainers today teaching um, clients to loose lead walk their dogs on two connection points. So, you know, usually a, a connection of the front and the back of the harness. But how many of these trainers know where this actually came from? And it was actually T-Touch. It was, it was T-Touch that developed this work um, probably 40 years ago, you know, when there weren't two point harnesses, when we were just sort of trying to work out how we could create two points of contact on a step in harness. Um, and, you know, and now obviously we've got these wonderful harnesses out there that have been specifically designed for these leading techniques. But it was it was in T-Touch and it came from leading exercises done with horses, um, but the two points of contact with dog, which dogs, which really is a game changer for helping dogs not to pull on the lead. And that work, you know, came from Linda and Robin. And so few people actually realize that that, that we were the originators of that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain to anybody that perhaps might not have come across um, the points and the pressures and the posture etc what what that kind of involves? Yeah are you talking in terms of um, of two points of contact on a dog as far as leading exercises? Yeah sorry yeah. Okay so probably the easiest thing is if I um, grab a stuffed dog hopefully um, I can just change my camera so you can um, see it. Can you see that okay, Claire? Perfect there, Alex. Yep. So if I just grab a lead, um, sorry. So I'm glad we're not live. <laughs> <laughs> um, so normally if you've got a dog just connected on the back of a harness or on a collar, um, the tendency is to get behind the dog and I just want to just change the angle of the camera just so you can see a little bit, lead a little bit better. There we go. So the, the, the handler can get behind the dog. The dog will pull into the harness and the dog pulls. And there's so often you will hear people talking about, um, you know, don't use a harness on the dog because it, it will encourage them to pull more. But with a with the kind of harnesses we use that we call a balancing harness, where you've got a high connection point, but we also use a second connection point at the front of the harness. And we use leads also that have sliding, um, sliding handles. And what we are trying to do is to walk the dog in the, perif in the dog's um, peripheral vision. So I just change the angle a little bit more. So should, if the dog pulls, rather than pulling the dog back, what we're gonna do is just bring the lead forward, put a little bit of pressure and then release away. What that's going to do is that's going to change the physical balance of the dog. Now, now what I really want to 
think about in this is the fact that there is a link between posture and behavior. And if we can change the physical balance of the dog, that in turn will change the mental and emotional balance of the dog. So what we really want when we're walking our dog on the lead, we want our dogs to be walking sort of balanced over their four paws. Now, I know that sounds easier said than done, and for some dogs that may just be too difficult, but using the two connection points, we can influence that posture. If the dog is pulling forward, we can just give a little signal from the front, followed by a release. And the release is so, so important, because if you don't release, then what, ten, what will happen is the dog will go into hard lean opposition. So the release just gives that dog a moment. Mm -hmm. And we do want to give those dogs a, a little pause just to be able to rebalance themselves and be able to walk in a calmer way. Mm. And, and when you see this, I remember seeing it because um, I was a little bit, when I came new into, into your workshop, I'd never done t-touch before and I was like oh what's all this about and then really when you change the posture by using the leads I was I was gobsmacked absolutely gobsmacked um which brings me on to a question because there's a wide range of harnesses out there um and a lot of questions I get asked are about the the ones that go across the front straps there how would that help or not help with the dog's posture I'm not a physio about it but I was um I was listening to a talk over the weekend with Rachel Jackson, who's a, both a T-touch practitioner and a vet physio. And, you know, she was talking about the problems of the sort of harnesses that go across um, and they're not the ideal solution. We want to have a harness that doesn't impede the dog's movement in any way. We want a harness with two connection points and ideally has been designed for this kind of work. And I think one of the issues that, that, that happens, and I see this with, with my own clients, is a lot of manufacturers have put front rings on harnesses and they put front rings in har harnesses um, because of public demand. And I'll be honest with you, I think a lot of manufacturers have no idea why we, why, why, why they've put the front rings on. It's just that people are asking for it. And then they try and use our techniques. And because it's not a balancing harness, maybe the front connection is too far back. Um, maybe the, the, the harness sits into the armpits of the dog. So it's going to impede their movement and it's not going to have the right effect. We like to use what we call a balancing harness. And there are harnesses on the market that have been specifically designed for the Tellington method um, and work I, and work perfectly for this method of of training. And I would say to anybody, um, you know, if you wander into you know your main your main high street pet shop, you're unlikely to find these types of harnesses. They tend to be ones that you'll find available from specialists um, online who probably have links with with Tellington T Touch. Mm -hmm. And it's worth investing in that for sure. I think um, I've got one of your harnesses and it's bloody brilliant, to be honest. Um, the other thing I'd, li I'd just like to say is, you know, a lot of trainers are using a, um, I'm just going to grab another lead. Okay. A lot, of a lot of owners and trainers will use your traditional double-ended lead that looks something like this with a clip at either end. All great, you know, better, better than nothing. But what I really like are the leads that we're now using in T-Touch. We call them Liberty Leashes or Liberty Leash Pros. And it has a couple of advantages. One, you've got a handle with a swivel. So rather than having to use two hands, you know, traditionally we would use two, we would be using two hands and you can end up sort of jerking the dog a lot. The nice thing about this is you've got the sliding handle, you've got the swivel to stop the dog from twisting. You can adjust it as well. So depending on the size, dog that you that you're working with and for a lot of owners it's so much easier to use one hand but one thing we would never advise is putting a hand through just in case the dog should pull and also you again can be a bit jerky but just just having the fingers through the handle and really guiding the dog just allowing the dog to move um, can be a really can make a really big change for the dog mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. I and mean, I guess that one hand would be really helpful because especially with people if they're, um, I know you don't use masses of treats in your training, but 
a lot of owners do, don't they? And and having that extra hand free could be could be useful for some people. Yeah, I would never recommend when doing le I'm I'm not against treats, don't get me wrong. And I do use food in, you know, we do we we use free work that, that's very food um involved with food. Um, but when it comes to leading exercises, we really discourage using food. And um, I would actually say to a client, just take the treat bag off because, what, you know, going back to what we were talking about before, we want that dog to be in, um, in physical balance. So if you're using a lot of food, what tends to happen is the dog is going to be turning back to you for the reward. It's going to be orientating to you and it's going to naturally bring themselves off balance. Um, so really i wouldn't be for loose lead walking be you be using food you know if a dog gets stuck i might you know i might just drop a couple of treats on the ground just to get their head down but i'm certainly not going to be luring the, the, the dog with food and i'm not going to be rewarding the dog for um you know for, 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 for a loose lead because again that just means the dog's going to be focusing on me rather than where 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 they are going Mm, absolutely and I'm really pleased you picked up on that because I think food is such a go-to um reinforcer for you know a lot of people they're like oh I can do it with food and stuff so seeing it from another angle and also realizing a real gold, uh, golden lesson for a lot of listeners today will be that you don't have to use food in every context um so I'm really pleased that you picked up on that Alex and then I think the other thing with food is you know, food can stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, the act of licking, the act of chewing. But for some dogs, it can also increase their arousal levels because a dog, and I know I've got I've got two dogs, I've got a Dalmatian um, who I want to talk about because she's so foodie. And if I work with her with food, it's, it's different if I'm doing some clicker training and I'm doing a short clicker session with her, that's great. But if I'm, if I go for a walk with her and I've got my treat bag on, the excitement and the, it just pushes her arousal level almost to that point of threshold um, and food is just not the right not the right solution for her free work that's a very different situation where I will set up elements I'll put food on it and she can go and explore she can lick she can um, she can chew um, uh, on her own terms but but when I've got her on the lead she's going to get just so excited about the food it's just not going to be um, an ideal solution. There is just one other thing we were, you know, talking about the um, loose lead walking. I just wanted to sort of mention an, um, one other piece of equipment that we've now that was developed a couple of years ago, and I can't remember if we had this on your workshop or whether it was after the workshop. And this is a piece of equipment called the connector. And Robin developed Robin developed this. Um, about two or three years ago. And the connector, um, is that phone going to be distractive? I just heard. No, it's, it's a little bit of a dancing. <laughs> oh, okay, because I, because. I, it's fine, it's fine. I assume this is going to be edited anyway, isn't it? Yeah, we can, we can do if you need, yeah. Um, so what the connector is, the connector um, basically distributes the pressure between the front and the back of the harness. We, you can connect the lead onto this. Now, where the connector can be re is re really useful is dogs that aren't so comfortable walking really close to you. And so you can use a long line, you can use a rope connect, uh, um, attached to a connector. And as you can see, that can move. So the dog, the dog can be a, can sort of have a bit more freedom, but again, we can actually help that, help the dog to be able to rebalance themselves using, using that connector. Because you know yourself, I'm sure, if you're using a long line on a dog, you know, you've only got the one connection point, the dog can get to the end of the long line, the dog is gonna get off balance. But if you add a connector onto it, then you've still got some influence of the dog's posture. And I know with my dog, my Husky, she it, it was a real game changer when we put her onto a connector because you know she's t-touch trained from a puppy but she's never been the greatest loose lead walker and it what i found is she doesn't like to be you know on a normal length lead she likes a little bit more space so just being able to extend the lead outwards add on the connector it, she can have a little bit more space 
I can also keep an element of control. And I don't like that word control. Um, it sounds very sort of dominant theory, but I can, I can at least help her to move in her own balance and using, you know, just by using that connector on, on, on it. The other thing that's really nice about the connector is if you've got a sort of wiggly dog, the dog can put their head through there without you having to force the lead over the dog's head. So again, it can help a dog that likes to move from side to side. And it just, I suppose, helps the dogs to make a few more choices of their own. Mm -hmm. Which we're massively advocating for. Um, more choices, the better, I think, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, fantastic. So there's a couple of things I want to pick up on there. You've mentioned free work a couple of times. Do you just want to quickly explain to the listeners what free work is? Yeah, free work was developed by Sarah Fisher. And whilst it's not technically part of the T-Touch toolbox, um, we do use it within T-Touch. I suppose we may use it slightly different to the way her and, and her people use it. Um, but free work, I found a really useful tool. Now, if you imagine setting up, we use the word elements um, or stations, and that might be a cone, that might be some different surfaces on the ground. The surfaces are really good because getting dogs to walk over different surfaces gives them a new sensory experience through their paws. So getting them to walk on different surfaces is really, really powerful for dogs. Um, we might use um, a stool, we might use things, so we, you might use things at different heights. Um, I have a cat litter tray with little plastic balls in that I can put food in, and we set these up. There's no particular way you set them up. I just set, an, I just set a area up in, in my garden with these. I put food on it, and I try to use a variety of soft food and hard food, because the hard food gets them using their molars, and chewing, soft food gets them, soft food gets them licking. Um, and, um, and essentially we strip the dogs naked. So what I mean by that is we let the dogs, we take the collar off, we take the harness off, and we literally just look, watch what the dog is doing. We, it's a great way for doing some deep observations. We can look at how the dog um, interacts with how a dog may interact with different stations, what might be more challenging for the dog, what might be more acceptable for the dog, and we just give the dog choices. We're not influencing the outcome. In fact, we don't want, we don't, there is no, no projected outcome. It's just, an, it's just an exercise of observations at the early stage. Mm -hmm. What we can then do is start to reintroduce equipment and, and this will give us a lot of information on how the dog interacts with that piece of equipment. Now, let me give you an example of that. I taught a workshop probably a couple of months after when, when you kindly invited me to your training center. And I taught it um, with, for a lady, an agility lady down in Bristol. And we had a dog, um, I, I, think he, I think he was a border, border collie, and he, ca he came on a Julius canine harness. Um, and it was a hell of a lot of harness for quite a small dog. And my instinct was he wasn't comfortable with this harness, but it's very difficult to say that to a client without the client taking offense. So I thought, well, the best way is let's ask the dog. And I, I, this is not trying to sound sort of hippy dippy about it or anything, but you know, dogs are communicating with us all the time and the dog is the best person to tell us this. So I set up some free work for this dog and we got the dog doing some free work, start, um, start naked. Um, and the dog was very interested, very engaged. And then I told the owner to pick up the harness and go and walk towards the dog with the harness. Now, this is where it got interesting the dog started to back away from the harness. The dog started to back away from the owner. Um, when the owner then put some treats on the ground for the dog, the dog was quite reticent of, putting, of having the harness put on. The harness was then put on and we continued the exercise. Now we suddenly noticed a complete change in the dog. The engagement had changed, the interest had changed. And in fact, the dog started to become quite clingy to the owner and didn't really want to engage with the situation. So I wanted to, you know, 
you want to prove it, proof these things. So I said to Bjorn, okay, let's take the harness off again. So the, the, har the, the, the client took the harness off and, and then the dog was willing to interact again. I then suggested, I said, okay, let's try a different kind of harness. So I gave them a T, I gave the, the client a T touch harness, and T touch harness is a really light harness. Um, and she put the T touch harness on the dog. That was a different experience. The dog was then willing to engage, but, but there was a ch another change in the dog, and the dog was a lot more happy with that T touch harness. So I could explain, I could say to the client, well, actually, that your dog has been, was, is, has, has just shown you that he, that, that he just doesn't like the Julius Canine harness. He's not saying he doesn't like harnesses because he's okay with the T-Touch harness, but that Julius Canine harness was not the right solution for him. And every dog is different. What might be the right solution for one dog might not be for another dog. So it, Again, it's a question of horses for courses, um, and but it was a really interesting e experiment. Um, and sometimes, if I've got a dog coming for a, for a client one to one, what I'll do is maybe spend fifteen minutes with the owner asking them some questions about the dog, what they're trying to achieve, and all the rest of it. And I'll listen, obviously, to what the client says. But sometimes clients don't always tell you what the real problem is so I want to ask the dog the same questions how do I do this no I haven't learned to speak dog I really wish I did I may I am a canine body language instructor um but I haven't I don't speak fluent dog but what I did do what I do do is um do some free work with the dog because I can get so much information I can really listen to what the dog tells me just by doing five or ten minutes of free work because that will give me a lot of information obviously I won't use free work as the only my only go-to it is just one tool within my toolbox and I'll use the body work and the other elements of t-touch as well fantastic fantastic I think asking the dog is it highlights a lot of things as well doesn't it because I don't know about you, but like with the pet industry, I think there's so many things available and it's very easy for a dog owner. I mean, I've been in this in this um, place as well. It's very easy for a dog owner to kind of go like, well, I'll just try this one or I'll just try this one. And, and we don't really think to we, I don't think a lot of people think to ask the dogs. And I've I've been guilty of that in the past. I'm like, yeah, we'll teach it on a collar. Well, actually, the dog's not that keen on the collar. Because I think a similar, similar thing happened at our workshop, didn't it? I was like, oh, my God, I've, put, I've ended up putting the collar in the bin. I was like, right, <laughs> they don't like it. Um, so it opens... I think collars are a really interesting one because, uh, you know, you've heard me say this on the workshop, but I, you know, I always say this to people. I say, you know, if you've got a child and you're in a crowded, you know, do you remember those days of crowds, you know, before this pandemic hit us, when we could go to crowded places, we could go to country shows. But I always say to people, you know, if you say you had a toddler and you were going to the Bath and West show as an example, you know, it's a huge, massive, massive show, thousands and thousands of people. And you've got an inquisitive small child and they, and, you know, I don't have human children. My children have wagging, wagging tails and four legs. But this is what I understand from people who have human children. You know, but the children want to get into every stand, particularly if, if there's a dog on the stand or the stand sells toys. And, you know, those sort of shows like Bath and West, you could easily lose, lose your child. Um, so people have some form of mechanism to attach the child. Now, if you look at these mechanisms, what are they normally? Something attached around the wrist, some form of backpack with, with a lead. How many times have you ever seen a child attached around the neck with a collar? And I always ask this question, why is it okay to do something to our dog children that isn't okay to do it to our human children? They're just as sensitive around the neck and around their breathing area as we are. After all, we are all mammals. Um, and yet we think it's okay to put, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a collar on a dog. I love collars. My dogs actually collect collars. And Arapaho, my husky, has got a really cool collar on at the moment that I bought from America and it's got elephants on because I'm I love elephants. Yeah. Um, but to me, the collar is for the ID tag and also to look pretty on the dog. But does the lead ever go on the collar? Not in a million years. I think the last time a Rapaho, who is 13 years old, had a collar attached, had a lead attached to her collar, was when she was with her breeder. But ever since she's been in my 
in my in my care she's always had a she's always been attached by a harness yeah no it makes and it makes sense doesn't it when you put it like that and and this is what I mean I think people get so easily and not rightly or wrongly it's just where they've what they've learned and how they've experienced and what they've gone through I think it's very easy to be led down a path because everybody else is doing it as well um and really when we think about it on a deeper level then yeah like you say why we wouldn't do it to a child so why do it to a dog Mm. and I, I think that is and I think you know People, you know, clients say to me, well, my, I, you know, I walk my dog on the collar because the dog, you know, my dog doesn't pull, so it's fine. I said, and my, my always come back is what happens if you're walking down the street and the car backfires or a cat runs across the road? The dog, you know, dogs will be dogs um, and the dog might get excited. The dog might be, might get startled and that, that is going to put pressure on the neck. So, you know, don't throw your collars away collect your collars have some awesome collars for your dog because particularly if you've got a short haired dog they look really cool on on you can get some really cool collars but please folks keep the leash attached to the harness love it love it um yeah fantastic um i just want to pick up there's loads i want to ask you alex but a couple of things i noticed there was you're on about the attachments and and kind of keeping the child with you now when we're looking at engagement or getting the dog listening and staying with the owner if you like what does engagement mean to you and do we always need to use uh, equipment if you like to, to keep that dog with us I would answer the question engagement do we need to use equipment yes but what is the most powerful piece of equipment that we can that we have and it's these my first piece of equipment I use is my is my hands and what is my go-to is for Tellington touches. Um, you know, we've got over 30 different touches and, there are, and you know, I will, use, I will use those touches for engagement. I will use those touches for communication. You know, um, people often think tea touch is a, for, is a form of massage. And Lindy Decker, who is one of our tea touch instructors based in Johannesburg, she has this lovely expression, which is tea touch is a message, not a massage. And, um, you know, so using using my hands, but everything's got to be done based on choice. And, you know, when it comes to engagement, um, I'm, I may do some touches on a dog, but I'm then going to give the dog a break and I'm going to see what the dog does. If the dog then nuzzles towards me and says, dad or, or uncle, if it's a client dog, <laughs> please give me more then yeah, of course I'm gonna carry on. If the dog looks away, turns away, moves away, sits away from me, um, then I'm gonna say, okay, that wasn't appropriate. I'm gonna give that dog a bit of a break. Maybe I'll try a different touch. Maybe I'll try something different. Maybe I'll stop, but it's gotta be on the dog's terms. I'm not gonna be, you know, I'm not gonna be forcing the dog to do things that the dog doesn't want to do. You know, it's, we were talking about this of a weekend on the, on a practitioner on the practitioner training about trust. You know, we always um, we always what am I trying to say? We 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 always say, um, do I trust my dog or I trust my dog or I don't trust my dog? But how often do we turn that question around and say, does our dog trust us? Does the dog have you know have that relationship with us? And I you know for me. I want that trust to be a two-way situation. And the more I can build my dog having trust in me, trust in the things that I do, the better that relationship is going to be. So to sort of go back to your question, engagement, I would rather think about relationship rather than engagement. And um, I really want to be, you know, really want to be thinking about what, you know, what relationship I can have with my dog. Can I can I be working on the dog's terms rather than on my terms? It's like stroking. You know, um, I used to do a lot of events. Some people would come up um, with, with their dogs and I had a member of staff and she was puppy mad and great. I love the fact she was puppy mad, but I did have to sometimes reel her in. And we came up, we, we put in a very clear rule um, at our shows, which you don't touch another uh, somebody else's dog unless you're either fitting a harness or you've asked the owner's permission first. And the, the other rule always was you do a little bit of touch with the back of the hand, 
give the dog a bit of a break, and then I'll let the dog decide whether it's appropriate or whether it's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a powerful message there. And just coming back to this trust element, can you explain to people how it feels for you when you really gain an animal's trust and connection? Because I want to dive a little bit into the sea life world that you used to go to as well. And that's still a mammal, still an animal, isn't it, if you like? But how, how does it feel when you when you gain an animal's trust and connection with the dogs first and then maybe we'll move into the the water world. I think I think when it comes to I think when it comes to dogs, it's it's about the dog being the more and Sarah Fisher always talks about um, building a trust account for your dog. In other words, thinking about it in terms of a bank account for dogs. So the more you can pay into that bank account, so that might be good times with the owner, that might be doing free work, that might be tea touch body work, gentle massage, all the good things. Um, that you can pay in, then when, the, when we have more challenging situations, stranger danger, dogs getting into each other's faces, lawnmowers in the summer, cars backfiring, the dog can cope with these with more, more challenging situations because you've built, this, you've built this trust account for the dog. So I'm always working to build my dog's trust account. It's like, you know, I'm sitting at, I'm sitting at home watching, watching, watching Netflix. Um, I have raised pet beds and I have like the, the, the bunk bed set up um, behind the sofa where I sit and watch television. The husky is normally on the top bunk bed. Now, now, she she's not one of those dogs who wants to be on the sofa right up to me she's a thick coated dog and in warm weather not she does, that's not really her, her thing but she does like to be on the top bed and what I tend to do is I'll sometimes be watching television I've got a hand behind me just doing a little bit of body work on her and I'm, I know she's enjoying that because if I stop, I get the paw on my arm saying, come on, carry on, carry on. And that's just a little thing that I might be doing. It's a little gift that I keep giving um, on a regular basis just to help her, um, you know, just to, just to help, just to give something to her to pay into her, into her, into her bank account. I also recognize the fact she's 13 years old. Um, she has mild hip dysplasia and I don't force her to go on long walks. She doesn't want that anymore in her life. We've got a lovely big garden here. And to be honest, you know, playing in the garden, doing some free work, that is what she wants in her life. Because I like going for long walks, um, doesn't mean that I have to drag a 13 year old Husky on a three hour walk because it would be way, way too much for her. It would fill, it would fill her emotional bucket, her arousal bucket, and that would be emptying that bank account rather than, rather than paying into the bank account. And I think, you know, a lot of people over, you know, I'm not, please don't think I'm, I'm advocating not walking your dogs, but, you know, a lot of people over-exercise their dogs because they like going for hikes. And rather than thinking, you know, is that really what your dog will not like? So like, I love going for long walks and I'm lucky, I, you know, I've got a housemate who also likes going for long walks and we go off the walks, but the dogs are old and they don't want, that's not what they want. They would rather be here on the sofa or, you know, or, or, or being in the garden. That's really what they want. And, and, you know, calmness is key. I've got two incredibly calm dogs, totally chilled. Um, and that hasn't just come, you know, and Huskies and Dalmatians are not breeds you associate necessarily with calmness, but it's been understanding them and, and thinking about what they want rather than what I want out of them. Mm, I love that. I love that. Yeah, the, the trust bank account. Um, so can we just move into the sea world life a little yeah, bit? Yeah, of course. Uh, you, you remember that I was a marine. I was a marine researcher. Yeah, I, I got your book, and I said before this to carry. I have. I can't re quite remember which animals you work with. So I guess you'd have to build up some form of connection and trust with those animals as well. Do you want to share a little bit more about? Yeah, I do. My main focus was humpback whales, and it was. I worked out in Australia. Um, with the most incredible people, um, Dr. Wally and Dr. Trish Franklin, um, who are probably some of the Southern Hemisphere's leading experts on humpback whales. And, you know, the most incredible characters you'll ever, you'll ever come across. And 
for those of you who are my age or older will may remember the reenactment of the first fleet that sailed from England to Australia to celebrate the Australian bicentenary and Wally and Trish were the people who actually put that expedition together. Um, and Wally had been a big name in, at, at Qantas, the airline, and it was when he put together the first fleet and they discovered what they, they saw whales on that, on that expedition, that they became passionate about it and set up the Oceania project to study the Australian East Coast humpbacks. And for those who are interested in humpback whales, it's what's known as Area 5 humpbacks. And we were sort of studying um, three sort of elements of the humpback. We were, we were looking of the southern migration and we were um, focusing on the movement, the abundance and the behavior of humpback whales and particularly mothers and calves. And I know you've come, you've invited me on to talk about dogs, but to, and to really answer your question, I need to give you a little bit of background because we worked in an area off Fraser Island, um, area called, uh, area, um, near the town of Harvey Bay in, um, on the Queensland mainland, but it was an area that is called Platypus Bay. And, um, and if you look at a map of Fraser Island, it goes from um, Rooney's Point at one end to Moon Point at the other end. It's quite a long area of, uh, a big bay area. And what is quite interesting about it is the waters are quite warm, the waters are quite shallow, and there's very few predators in the area. There are very, very the, 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 um, the orcas or the killer whales don't tend to come into that area. So it's become a nursery area for the mums and calves. And we were doing a lot of work with watching the mums and calves and looking at the role of the escort, which is the another whale that would accompany the mother and calf. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, whaling, Whaling finished in Australia in, um, in 1978 on the West Coast, but on the East Coast of Australia, whaling ended in 19, <coughs> excuse me, 1935, I think I'm right in saying. Um, and the reason the whaling ended, and though Australia is today one of the most you know, conservation-minded countries on the planet, um, in those days, you know, the reason whaling ended wasn't because of conservation, but it was because they literally ran out of whales. And a, a post-whaling um, population of 150,000 whales on the Australian East Coast humpbacks, that is, were whaled down to, I believe it was, it was under, 200, under, under 200 humpback whales. Um, absolutely, dead. That pop the population was absolutely devastated. And, you know, thanks to the great work of the Australian government, Greenpeace um, and other whale, whale, the Oceania Project and other whale organisations, you know, um, you know, the numbers have grown and the numbers have really grown exponentially. It's been an absolutely incredible, you know, the science will tell you that if a, if a population goes below 10%, then their, their numbers will never recover. But the humpback whale um, defied all those because some, something really important that Trisha always taught me is remember that, that animals, whatever animal you're studying, they'd never read the literature. And, you know, the science will tell you that a humpback mother will give birth once every three years. But in fact, we were seeing mothers with new calves on consecutive years in Harvey Bay. And that was really, really interesting. But where I'm sort of going with this is, you know, for many, many years, a humpback whale and Remember, it was, you know, a lot of these whales that were left were an older population um, and they would see boats and they would see um, they would see a harpoon on a harpoon on the end of the boat and they would, um, you know, and they would think of a boat approaches them. That's going to be, you know, that harpoon is going to go into them and a very, very painful death. And when I was working out in Harvey Bay, and I was there from 1999 to um, 2007, and I was there for two weeks a year on the expedition, it was absolutely amazing. But you would see mothers coming up to our vessel, and they would bring newborn calves, and they would allow the calves to actually come up to us. And I've got video footage, um, and absolutely amazing footage of mums and calves um, you know, literally, you know, within five meters of me, and you know, I'm on the back deck of the, of the boat, shooting at them, not with a harpoon, but with a camera, 
Um, and you can, I'm literally eyeballing mother and calf humpbacks. So the element of the trust of these incredible creatures. And, the, and I think the other thing we must remember is the forgiveness of these creatures, that they are willing to, to forgive human beings for the atrocities that we did to them in the 19, in, in the 19 sort of 30s, 1940s and so on. And they're willing to interact with us. And, you know, mothers are bring, willing to bring their, their, their young and say hello to us. And, you know, in Harvey Bay, it wasn't just us on, on the research vessel. There was also an American research vessel from the Pacific Whale Foundation, plus about 15 commercial whale watching boats in the area. So we really were a whale, we were, really were a whale fleet, sometimes of up to 20 vessels um, in the bay. And of course, there were very strict restrictions on how many boats could approach a pod of whales, how close we could get to them unless the whale chose to interact with us. Um, but um, it was, you know, we had to keep a minimum, a, a minimum, we, our minimum approach distance was a hundred, was a hundred meters. But again, nobody told the whales that. So we would stop and switch off our engines at a hundred meters. But so often the, the mums and calves would actually come and we used to call it a mugging because we would sometimes be there for half an hour, literally being mugged by whales. And it was um, just an, an extraordinary experience. It sounds it. It's, I'm, I'm, I've never done it, but it fascinates me and scares me at the same time. Um, and just hearing you explain that is kind of yeah it's the, the trust that you must have and the connection that you must have had between them must have been phenomenal an experience to never forget I, I guess yeah and I think it it is and I think you know I was very lucky um you know a lot of people's first and sometimes only experience with whales is going out on a whale watching boat and there'll be a tour guide just pointing things out. My experience was very different. I was very lucky to be a research intern with um, the Oceania project and I was lucky enough to be mentored by um, Wally and Trish Franklin, who are two of the most extraordinary people that I've ever met. Um, and they really did share their knowledge and they did coach us and we did get to learn an enormous amount just by being around these people and spending time at sea. Um, you know, we would we would be at sea for a week at a time. And in fact, we were we were at sea when the Twin Towers came down in New York. And that was quite a, a surreal experience because we didn't have a television on the boat. Um, and all we the first we heard about it was um, was chatter on the ship sh to shore radios between the whale watching fleet that came in and out every day. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow, it's um, yeah, incredible. Um, so Alex, what, we've, we've covered loads here today and I've still got a thousand questions I wanna ask. I'm, I'll take us a lot, if you've got the time, I'll happily answer the questions. <laughs> I'm like, oh, which one do I go for? <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe what would be your top three touching tips for the listeners that would help them with their dog on either a loose lead, a trust, a connections basis? What would be your top three tips for them? Respect. Be mindful of the dog. Um, and it's about the dog, not, not about you. You know, we are sharing our lives with these incredible creatures called dogs. And, you know, look at the body language of the dog, learn about the body language of a dog, take a body language course, because, you know, you know, I, I teach body language. It's something I'm very, very passionate about. And, you know, understanding canine body language really does build a relationship with your dog. It does mean you can communicate with the dog because so many issues happen when we, we don't read a dog. And a lot of bites could be avoided. A lot of unpleasantness can be avoided if we just looked at, at how at what might be escalating and doing something as simple as just getting that dog moving um, is all we need to ask the dog. Just you know, being in a stressful situation for the dog, holding the dog on the lead, the dog, the dog, people say, oh, the dog is being um, is being naughty or antsy on the lead or, or is lead grabbing. Just get that dog moving, get that dog out of that situation because that's all the dog needs. 
in many situations, but we 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 don't look at things enough from the dog's point of view. Mm -hmm. That would be my number one. Um, number, gosh, number two, you know, loose leaf walking is, you know, even if you live on a farm and you don't, you, you rarely have to walk the dog on the lead, you know, teach your dog to walk on a loose lead, but use appropriate equipment, use appropriate um, methods. You don't need to use fear and force. Um, you know, it, you know, most dogs will loose lead walk and using the two points of contact, using, um, using, you know, using the Tellington leading methods can make such a big difference. Mm -hmm. And number three, explore the bodywork elements of T-Touch because bodywork can help to release stress from the dog. It can help to release tension for the dog. It's a way of communicating with the dog. We're not being masseurs. We're working with the nervous system of the dog. And even if you just learn one or two touches, um, you know, use those touches. You don't need to be an expert on all the touches and know their names and all the rest of it, but just having a couple of touches in your toolbox. The zebra touch, which is, which is um, if I grab a little stuffy here, um, is just literally just moving your hands from across the dog, giving the dog awareness from, from uh, where on its body, where its body begins and ends, where its body, so where the dog's body begins and ends and where the real world begins and ends can be really helpful for the dog. And you, all we do is we just start with a finger, the fingers in the claw at the shoulder, open the fingers as we come down, up to close, down to open, and we can go both sides of the dog. And this will just really help the dog just have that little bit of body awareness. And if you never learn another Tellington touch and you just know the zebra touch, that's going to benefit the dog. It will take too long on this interview to teach you a number of the circular touches, but you know, learn some of the circular touches. They, again, can be so calming, so useful um, to help your dog. Mm, I love that. I love all of them, um, which has kind of led me on nicely in where people can go to find out more about what you do. Because before you answer that, I just want to, I, I say with Hunter, my youngest shepherd, we did a lot of this work with him. Um, he was quite averse to being touched and we did a lot of work with it. And, and I came to your workshop with the Tellington Tea Touch. And I always say that he's never really bothered by getting a fuss from other people. Well, yesterday he absolutely called me a plain blank liar because he was over with this woman and her child and he was like lapping it off. He's like, yeah, love me, love me. <laughs> so I would strongly recommend this, Alex. Where can people go to find out more about you and what you do? Well, my, my website is extradog.training. That's X-T-R-A dog.training. Um, and you can find out we run regular courses um we run regular courses we do have a two-day um we do have a two-day course on the 25th and 26th of september on which is being run on zoom um and we still have a couple of places left on that and it's an introduction course but it can also count towards practitioner training we also run um practitioner training courses you will train as a Tellington T-Touch practitioner. Um, at the moment, we're running them solely um, live stream, but it, it's live stream sandwiched with online learning with Robin Hood. Um, our next course is in November. That one is sold out, but we are we do have a course coming up in March. And if you go to our website, you can pre-register for that. Also, in April, Linda Tellington Jones, the founder of Tellington Tea Touch, we're very excited to announce that Linda is coming over to the UK at the beginning of April, and we will be running a two-day in-person workshop with her. Um, on the, I think it's the second and the third of April, um, and it'll be run. It'll be run at a venue near near Loughborough. Um, the, the tickets on are going on sale in October, and that really will be a wonderful opportunity to learn from Linda. Um, and again, if you are interested in the practitioner training program, that those days will be accredited towards practitioner tra training and it will give you four points from the um, 60 points you need to become a practitioner. So um, that's one to look out for, but everything you can find is on my website, extra with an X, extradog.training. 
um, and um, you know if anybody would is interested in a practitioner training program I do um, one I do sort of 15 minute discovery calls and more than happy and you can book one of those on the homepage of my website more than happy to have a chat about the practitioner training program if that's something you'd be interested in fantastic Fantastic, Alec. I have definitely made notes of the 2nd and 3rd of April, um, so you'll most likely see me there. And hopefully we'll see a few more of you there on some of Alex's uh, workshops and programmes. Alex, thank you very much. Um, oh, there's one more question I wanted to ask you, actually. Um, going back a little bit, what are you watching on Netflix? Gosh, well, I like crime, I, 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 I like crime dramas. I like dramas, actually. One of the shows I re I'm really enjoying at the moment it actually features T-Touch, um, but from the horse side of it, um, which is a show called Heartland. And, you know, it's been around for years. Um, and I literally, you know, kept coming from a background in the horse industry, I watched a couple of early episodes a few years ago, and I'm just sort of half, wa half watching it. And suddenly um, one of the characters says, I'm doing tea touch on this horse while well, my, my ears prick up. <laughs> and I think it, you know, I was just absolutely gobsmacked. And, um, you know, we've had, you know, tea touch has been on television. There was a show years ago with Sarah Fisher um, called Talking to Animals. But I think this was the first time that I had seen, um, I had seen a show um, you know, a mainstream drama where T Touch was referred to, and I remember I remember emailing Robin, um, Robin Hoodlin, the sister who I work very closely with. And I said, Robin, I'm watching Heartland, and they're just talking about T Touch, and she and she met, emailed me back, and she said, Well, what? We're in the original books. The, um, the the woman who runs Heartland is a T Touch practitioner, and um, when we when when they were filming it, they actually asked us for a for a practitioner certificate to put up in the office. And if you watch really carefully, um, there you do you can occasionally see the certificate on the wall of the office where um, in in the show. And I'm sad enough to be looking for these things. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, I think I've watched a couple of those episodes a long time ago. Um, but now, because I'm looking for something to watch, um, I will be looking for that same certificate, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nice that it's, prom it's promoting positive training with horses. I'm, you know, I'm not um, a horse practitioner. Um, it is something I'm looking at. I'm looking at starting the horse training myself because I think it would be it's the next, the next, uh, the next step in my in my journey. Um, but it's lovely to see something like that, which is promoting positive, positive training, because I think, you know, the horse world is behind the dog world. We're very lucky here in the UK because I think we are the world's leaders in positive training for dogs um, and hope, you know, and it would be nice to see the horse world catch up to us where we are in, in, in the dog world and to see, you know, positive, positive methods of training horses using, you know, methods without fear and force would be just incredible, would be fantastic to see. Yeah, completely agree. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing more about what you do with those horses um, and coming and learning more from you as well, Alex. So we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for giving us your time and sharing some of your knowledge with us. It's been absolutely incredible. And I would recommend listening to this interview a good few times because there has been lots of golden nuggets in here. Um, Alex, from me to you. I think we have an ebook, don't we, to oh. the, for your for your readers. I've given I sent you a link. Oh, well, so please feel free to um, to share the um, to share the link with with you to share the link with your with your readers, um, your viewers. Sorry, to share the link with your with your viewers um, because there is a you know there's a free thirty page ebook um that they're very welcome to which at least it, it's got enough it's got it's got information on three or four of the touches in there how to do them some stuff about the leading exercises some stuff about body wraps that we haven't talked about today um so um it will be a good it's a good starting point for anybody on their tea touch journey fantastic well thank you very much alex that's very generous of you so there you go guys i will make sure we link in both alex's website and the link to the ebook so you can grab that um, and go and learn more about this wonderful talent and t-touch um, that will help you to better connect with uh with, to connect with your dog and of course improve yours and their listening skills so we'll leave it there guys thanks again alex um, and we'll see you on the next interview